Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Wasn't it a beautiful morning this morning? I walked here um, from the hotel and I kept the, the song, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, kept going in my head. And I didn't even go to a show or anything last night. I was like, <laughs> um, it, well, it's not singing in the rain anymore. It's like a beautiful morning. So it's good morning. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming. I am so excited about today. And I'm excited to see some of our Newton board members in the audience. Can, if you're a Newton board member, could you please raise your hand? So we have folks here from the National University Technology Network uh, Board. They're having their uh, mid-year meeting here in conjunction with the summit. We are all members of the National University Technology Network, and, um, and uh, we in have invited them to um, kind of co, um, you know, uh, do their board meeting and also participate in the summit at the same time so that um, we all can have the benefit of um, leveraging the N in Newton and network with them. And so I'm hoping, raise your hands again, you guys, please introduce yourselves uh, to, um, if, you know, Newton people introduce yourselves to the SUNY people and vice versa. I'm hoping that um, you, uh, you know, can, um, you know, learn where they're from and, and a little bit about what they do. They are our colleagues and our compatriots. It's in our um, passion and zeal for um, if online uh, teaching and learning or technology enhanced instruction. And so I hope that um, uh, I welcome the Newton folks and, and I encourage you all to, um, to get to know them. Um, so uh, all of a sudden I realized it got a little bit quiet in here and I asked the time and it's 9.12 and I don't know where that those 12 minutes went. Um, so I want to get us um, moving along with our... Uh, today and bring up our first uh, our first speaker uh, Carla Casilli is here um, did I say that right Carla your last name um, uh, she's a digital credential strategist and um, uh, she has done some um, amazing pioneering work in uh, online digital credentials and she's going to talk with us about making sense of this new world of digital credentials and so I'd like to have a warm welcome for Carla thank you very much Hi, everybody. I am very honored to be talking with you all today. I am not used to quite this kind of um, left-right uh, dichotomy, but um, uh, I do want to thank everybody and encourage people to ask questions. I, am, I have a lot prepared to talk to you about, but I do want to encourage questions. So if you have questions at, at, um, during the time that I'm presenting, please feel free to stop and interrupt. A little bit about my history. Um, as was mentioned by Alex, I have been working in what was um, called the alternative credential world, um, that I no longer use the word alternative, <clears throat> um, and I call them new forms of credentials. And those new forms of credentials that I'll be talking about primarily today are about badges and, um, and open badges, and that's historically my experience. So I come from about um, five years of working in the Mozilla Open Badges world. I was one of the original team members for the Open Badges initiative. Um, I'll go into it a little bit. I will explain um, what Open Badges are. We'll talk a little bit about credentials. We'll also talk about who's involved in these things because I know a lot of questions are really coming from who's using these things. And I have primarily pulled examples from post-secondary um, just to give you an idea of who's operating in the world. But there are many, many people. You can't hear me? <laughs> How about now? Ooh, okay. That's a little close. Um, okay, so uh, my name is Carla Casilli, and I'm going to be talking to you about badges and digital credentials, and we're going to talk about making sense of the new world of credentials. Um, I normally would not be standing at a podium. I'd be walking around a little bit, but um, I, like it's, you can see that I'm having problems with where I might put a mic. Um, so let's dive in. Um, this is who I am, and that's how you can reach me on Twitter, and that's actually how I was reached, um, which was on Twitter, um, so that's the, my um, name. Um, today's presentation, we're going to talk about degrees, badges, communities, um, credentials, and then what's ahead for us. Um, so let's dive in and talk about degrees. Um, 
Uh, I pulled this quote from a tweet yesterday. <laughs> um, there are about 7 million New York State residents who have a high school diploma or some college, and that's from the 2015 census. Um, and that was a tweet by Christine Kroll yesterday. And uh, I found that to be a really important reference point because I think a lot of point times we're looking at the degree as the way that everybody gets credentialed and acknowledged. And right there you can see that there are 7 million people who are not acknowledged in some way. They're only acknowledged because they have a high school d diploma, and that's not necessarily going to benefit them. So the idea about um, moving people to a degree, um, these are our basic assumptions about a degree, right? That it's universal, it's understood, and it's clear. Uh, we're going to dive into that. Um, and then uh, I just want to have a, a quote that I think is really telling. Um, I'm going to let everybody read that one. I'm going to give you another quote. I want to highlight the word never in there. <laughs> That's a quote from the senior vice president of operations at Google. And that was a quote in 2013 in the New York Times. I think this is an indication that workforce and education are changing. And they're changing pretty dramatically, pretty fast. And, um, and we need to be cognizant of where we're headed with when we talk about a degree. The degree reality is that it's a generalized concept. It sends mixed signals and then it's opaque. And this is becoming an issue for people and particularly when we talk about workforce, um, but also for the students. They don't really understand when they're entering the environment. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the idea of um, the traditional student because that's where we often end up talking about the traditional student but the non-traditional student is actually now the traditional student and that people who are attending um, because they're working full time, people who are actually already have a degree and are going back for something, um, all of these people are the people that we're talking about now. It's not just the kid who's coming out of high school who's 18 who's entering into a comprehensive environment. Um, so I really try um, very hard to talk about post-secondary rather than just um, higher ed. So this is my little joke here, so I'm pretty sure that everybody knows what that image is, but if you don't, it's from the treasure of Sierra Madre. And there's one famous line, right, that I won't repeat, but um, I have heard multiple times. <laughs> So I just want to give you a little bit of background about where badges came from and why we think they're important. So in 2010, um, there was an event called, uh, at that point it was called the Drumbeat Festival. It was held by Mozilla. Those of you who are familiar with Mozilla, we, like to say, we used to like to say we saved the internet with the Firefox browser. Um, <laughs> but we, they do a lot of other things too. And um, they have a festival every year. It used to be themed, the theme always included Freedom and the web, something freedom and the web, right? Because that's where Mozilla comes from. That's their ethos. And um, in 2010, it was about learning freedom and the web. And we started to ask ourselves questions about what about all of the, um, the agency that the web was providing? What about all of the information that people could then learn all by themselves that there wasn't necessarily a formal classroom? People were teaching themselves. And um, we were curious about what if, um, in addition to capturing learning wherever and whenever it was occurring, we could do it in the form of badges. And what if we could do it in a way that put the earner at the very center of this experience and not necessarily the issuer of the credential, but the earner, not necessarily the consumer of the credential, but the earner. And this is a so kind of a tough slide to see, but it does represent the idea of the ecosystem when it was originally the idea that was the original idea behind open badges. I mean, it, it was also kind of focused on the idea that, that there would be informal learning that was being captured and that formal learning was already being addressed by things like degrees and certificates. Surprisingly enough, we've gotten a huge amount of uptake in the world of um, formal education. Um, I think this is a very important slide, and I would say that the um, two things that are most important on this slide, not necessarily in any order, are the fact that badges are digital representations. They are not the thing. They're the thing that represents the thing. Um, and then the word et cetera is very, very important on this slide um, because I know that there's a huge drive to standardize the way people understand learning and to standardize the way that it's assessed and then acknowledged. Um, but badges are, are very comprehensive. They're very agnostic about the way that they get used and that is intentional. So there, there was no standard that said badges must be used in this way. And um, I'm extremely grateful for this. I have to say when I came in to work with uh, the team, I was the third person on the team. I'm like, oh, we need to create standards and all of these things. And uh, Aaron Knight, who's really the, the parent of Open Badges, um, 
said, no, we actually want to see what people produce. We want to see what people produce before we start making it prescriptive. We want to see, we want to be descriptive right now. And that has been a really rewarding and successful path for us to take. Um, these are some of the basic tenets of badges. I think, again, there are all kinds of things that are on that say, um, slide. Um, really kind of five words specifically. Interoperable is incredibly, incredibly important. It's recognizing that learning should be able to move anywhere, it should not be locked into a specific spot. Um, and, uh, and that's the way badges are designed. The other thing is they can do things like map learning pathways, connecting formal and informal. So they're really meant to be a cohesive thing. They're meant to tie things together. And they're also meant to represent opportunities. Um, uh, many years ago when I used to speak about badges, many years, about five years ago, um, uh, I would talk about what the opportunities were. A lot of times when people look at them, they want to slot them into the status quo. But what badges really allow people to do is say, here's an open door. Look through that door. What's the vista you want to see? What's the thing you want to have happen? Make it with these things. So that's the reason that it was more descriptive in our approach. Um, so one of the things that badges can do is actually start to provide um, what is sometimes referred to as you can try on future selves. So if there are all these opportunities in front of you, you can start to look and say, wow, I have all of these different aspects of learning, and here are all these pathways in front of me that I was not aware of, right? So one of the things we're trying to do, and because they're digital representations, they can represent um, visually to people what are, what are the opportunities in front of them. I love this slide because it was designed by one of our community members and it kind of is a, a nice representation of what badges are. Um, so a lot of times people look at them and they're like, oh, they're just this kind of stamp thing. And um, if you peel, there's a layer, obviously there's a top layer that's the visual, but if you peel it back, it actually has all of this content within a badge. So it carries metadata. And that means it's an evidence-based, what sometimes is called a micro-credential, and by the way, Badges, micro-credentials, we'll talk about all of those, and there are almost a lot more things that are similar than, than are different. Um, this was created by uh, Kyle Bowen, who was at Purdue and is now at Penn State. So this is this image is, um, and, but this is actually the exact content of, and I don't know why this, this image is a little stretched, but um, that, that actually includes all the metadata. Um, that's all the metadata that can go into a badge. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what that content is. I want to be cognizant of the time, too. Um, so obviously, the badge criteria is right now, um, as far as I'm concerned, a little bit of a Wild West section of badges, because anybody can put whatever they want into that section. Um, and there is work that is starting to look at the criteria portion. <clears throat> um, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know is that you can have an issue date for a badge, and it can also um, have an expiration date. So you can understand that some learning might become stale after a certain time period, and that might be useful to a consumer of the badge. It might also be useful to the person who has earned the badge to get an understanding of what's the typical time frame that this is meaningful or valuable material that they've learned. Um, the three, la the three things that are on the, on the bottom I want to talk about too is um, alignment was actually a section that was suggested to us by our community members. It was not in the original aspect of the metadata. Um, this gives me an opportunity to talk about the fact that it's an open source software tool. And that means that anybody can look at the, the content. They can go onto the GitHub repository, take a look at it. And if you don't like it, you can fork it. Um, and, and that was not a curse, by the way. That's okay. <laughs> Um, you can take it and you can change it and you can and make it into something that you want. But the goal really is that we all collectively work together and we collectively build this and that it's not one institution saying, this is what a badge is, this is how it should be used. It's not one organization saying that, but is instead is a community of voices saying, these are helpful, this is getting us to a place where we need to be. Um, so alignment was one of those things that was added into the metadata because there are all kinds of things that, we don't wanna recreate the wheel if we don't have to, right? There are all kinds of alignments that people have, there are all kinds of certificates that already exist, there are all kinds of professional standards that just allows you to point to them. It says, this badge actually points to a standard that exists in the world already. Um, and then expiration date I talked about. Evidence URL is really the thing that separates badges from stamps. Uh, and um, well, the metadata separates it from being a stamp, but um, the evidence URL is the thing that makes it into a credential. 
Um, and that credential is essentially anything that I would have done. So for example, let's say I took a class in biology and I had a lab and, uh, and there was a badge issued for that whole course. Now that's not necessarily something I'm recommending. I'm just using this as an example. And attached to my badge are actually all my lab work, is all my lab work. Maybe it's video of me in the lab. Maybe it's actually my lab results. Maybe it's um, content that I've written. Maybe it's a paper. <clears throat> that gets attached to the badge so that when that badge goes anywhere, someone can actually look at what it is I've done in order to earn that credential. <clears throat> that is a game changer in a lot of ways. Um, I will also say that we know it complicates the conversation about consumption. Just going to put that out there. <laughs> um, if you are interested in understanding the Open Badges specification, there is a website you can go to. It is openbadgespec.org. It's not showing up on this video um, screen, but it's actually showing up on this one. Um, but it is openbadgespec.org, not two S's, one S. And you can take a look at um, the documentation, the technical spec that underpins all of the work that we're, we've been doing over the last few years. This was, um, these are some data from March 2015. You can see how many people are actually issuing badges. There are tons of badges already out there. There are tons of um, people using them, not just in the US, but also worldwide. <clears throat> so a little bit of our community. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the changes that they've helped us make in the work and the metadata. Um, I do want to note that I put this slide in there for me because I thought this yesterday because the term kept coming up, best practices. Um, but it's not necessarily best practices when we talk about things like these new forms of credentials, but actually informed practices and understanding that there's context in, with, in, in which these things take place and are used. And they are, it's not a universal aspect. So I'm going to take some time and I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different organizations that are using um, these badges and I'll try to give you a little bit of background about how they're using them. Um, one thing that I will note is because Mozilla um, started this as an open um, technical specification that it's open source, that means that people don't need to check in with any specific organization. And by the way, Mozilla spun out the Badge Alliance, and the Badge Alliance is actually now the ecosystem shepherd of all of the work, so no longer Mozilla. Um, and, uh, and so all of that work is still taking place, but I do want to note that there's work taking place that we are completely unaware of because people don't need to contact us to, to align with this work. They can automatically just start working with it. So this is coming out of Purdue University. They've developed essentially a badge issuing platform called Passport. Passport seems to be a very popular term when it comes to badges. It gets used a lot. Um, there is work that was done with um, University of California at Davis. Uh, one of the things I particularly liked about this, um, this badge exploration, and it was really still an exploration, it's not implemented. Um, and some of these are implemented and some are not. Um, and some are representations of the digital media and learning competition that took place a number of years ago, um, funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And I do want to note that the MacArthur Foundation funded uh, all the badges work. So, um, And uh, for those of you who are cognizant of it, they um, spun out an organization themselves. It's now um, Collective Shift. And the LRNG work is actually an aspect of this. And they are taking, they've taken over the cities of learning work. If you have questions about the initial Chicago Summer of Learning work, I have many stories. <laughs> but um, I want to talk a little bit about this because what I like about this work is that um, what the instructor did was create essentially a structure within which the students could create their badges. So they created a system and then encouraged students to be very um, uh, have a lot of self-efficacy and acknowledge an agency and, and acknowledge what they wanted to pursue and then develop badges and then essentially um, pledge towards the badges. So it was a very interactive uh, approach to the way that badges get work. So it's not coming specifically. While University of California Davis kind of owned the system, the students were developing that right along with them. Um, within the University of Michigan, um, there's Emblem. Again, this is also something that was developed in concert with the students. So even the name Emblem was just, was created by the students who were working on this. <clears throat> so University of Michigan um, also has a medical school. They are also developing badges. Um, and uh, um, at Indiana University, so this is this is kind of a range of different ways that things are being used. Indiana University actually had a um, what was called a book instead of a MOOC, so it was a big open online course. <laughs> 
Um, and, and it was looking at assessment principles. And again, some of this work was coming out of the DML competition. Um, this was work done by Dan Hickey. If you guys are familiar with him. <clears throat> He's been doing a lot of research into open badges over the last four years. He was also funded by the MacArthur Foundation to look at um, the work that was coming out of the DML competition. Lots of um, interesting concepts and th uh, thoughts behind that, too. Um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, you can see these are all samples, but they're investigating the idea of badges. Um, so I'm just heading through a lot of uh, higher ed right now. Um, Coastal Carolina University is also, so these are some smaller organizations, some smaller universities are looking at badges and investigating them, and you can take a look at, I'm not going to um, go through all of them, but you can see that um, things like copycat is a very interesting badge, right? So some of these things are asking questions questions about what the experience of working with um, working in uh, post-secondary feels like. Um, and, uh, and they aren't necessarily all curriculum badges. They're not curriculum based. So there's a whole lot of co-curricular badges because badges can be used to acknowledge what are, I'm going to air quote, soft skills. Um, right, so 21st century skills, non-cognitive skills, all of those things, and those are actually the things that we have been finding that workforce are most interested in, those things that are really hard to quantify. Um, but that's where badges can come in. Uh, Deakin University is a university um, out of Australia, and they are doing a whole lot of really interesting work. Um, they uh, ask the students to um, develop and work on their badges, but they also have a very heavy-duty assessment process associated with them. Curtin University, also based out of Australia. Um, Australia is hot for badges. <laughs> There's a whole lot of badging work taking place in Australia and also New Zealand. Um, so Curtin University also working. They have a, a game-based system, but then they also have badges that operate alongside it. Um, there is work taking place from a peer perspective. So I'm not sure people familiar with peer-to-peer -peer university. Um, that's what this one is. Uh, I do want to note peer-to-peer -peer university. There was a discussion yesterday when we were talking about the concierges. I kept thinking about the thing that peer-to-peer -peer university just introduced, which was come together and take a MOOC collectively. Um, so you don't have to do it individually. You can gather together. I just love this idea. It seems so smart to me. Um, it, it makes the most of face-to-face -face interactions, but it also relies very heavily on the technology that exists. So, um, but they are also, uh, they have a platform for badges as well. Um, when we start to move into the world of 4-H, we start to get a better picture of understanding how badges can be used to represent civic activity, so not just necessarily learning in the way that we think about it, formal academic learning that might lead to a job, but instead understanding how we collectively all fit together as a community. Um, cultural institutions, this is the American Museum of Natural History right here in New York, and, uh, and they have a series of badges. The one thing that I would like to say is large cultural institutions play a huge role in many, many people's learning experiences, and this allows them to start to play on the field that everybody else is. Um, I mentioned this briefly already. This is the Cities of Learning. This is a screenshot from um, the first year of the Cities of Learning, where it really was just one city of learning, which was the Chicago Summer of Learning. And, uh, and, uh, and I will have a brief stop to talk a little bit about um, the complexity when you start to have cities starting to use things like badges. This is very important to have cultural and governmental buy-in. And this was coming directly from Rahm Emanuel. Understandably, that the MacArthur Foundation is based in Chicago, so there was a direct connection. There was a lot of pressure that could be put to bear on um, the way that things came into being. It was very successful. Um, I developed the, the badge system for the city of this city of learning, um, Chicago Summer of Learning. And I have to say, I developed things, I added things in there that I'm like, oh, no one's going to get this. So I'm going to make this super high so that people have things to achieve. And blew our mind, but kids actually achieved it. They had eight weeks in order to get through five different badges that would move them to what was called a city-level badge. Once they got um, all five of those badges, and they were based on the STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, um, they had to get to those badges. And when you got all five of those badges, then you earned what was called the mayor's badge. We didn't think anybody was going to get there because it was eight weeks, not a lot of time. Um, and kids did it, and we were really blown away. So um, my comment to everybody developing badge systems is you can make them as hard as you think you want to, and people will still try really hard to get them. Um, so I was really, I was, that was a learning experience for me. Um, government agencies, NASA also issued a badge. Now, again, this also came out of the digital media and learning competition from a few years ago. Um, I have a, a, um, a few in here representing professional development. So RSA Consulting is based out of the UK. They have um, a badge system as well. 
Um, also professional development, Dale Carnegie training issues badges. Um, workforce, the Manufacturing Institute is issuing badges. This is a really interesting aspect for us because it's moving um, it's into the world of workforce and recognition for prior learning. And, uh, and prior learning plays a huge role in, in the way that we think badges can function extremely well. Um, IBM has introduced badges also for a MOOC. Um, I would say they have had unbelievable results. I mean, this is, it's almost, it's almost impossible to believe um, the results that they've had in completion rates for um, the MOOC that they've introduced badges for. And then also, additionally, they've had increase in the ways that people have downloaded potential um, pieces of software. It has just galvanized an industry that is concerned about the fact that they have, they're a graying industry. Um, IBM is. Actually, their organization is a graying organization, and please don't quote me on that. Um, and uh, and um, and they're concerned about the millennium millennial crowd understanding that IBM is still a valuable and important reference point for technology. Um, and this has been a really interesting experiment for them, and really, really wildly successful. Um, you can see that there are four badges that are up there right now: Explorer, Advocate, Inventor, and Certified. Um, they are in process and currently being used at IBM. Adobe also has been um, introducing badges. Some of these are coming out of a connection with Pearson. Pearson is obviously, I'm pretty sure everybody knows Pearson in this room. Um, and they are a badge issuing platform. Uh, and so some of these are coming from that. Um, one other area that we're, we are working very heavily on is the idea of human resources, getting people to understand what these things are, because they're new. And, um, and the degree isn't understood, but a badge is very confusing. What is this thing? And the comment that I made earlier about the criteria portion is something to keep in mind that um, it's a little bit Wild West and, uh, and there's work happening there. Um, okay, so that brings me to this portion of the, um, not just badges, but credentials, right? So we don't need no stinking credentials, right? Um, <laughs> so so um, I have this slide in here because uh, the idea really is, as we move forward, that credentials are an open concept and that we're opening them up to beyond the degree, beyond the certificate, um, and that they are inclusive of many, many more things. And they are inclusive of these things that we're looking at right on this slide. And I've added the word et cetera here because it is a changing world. And this is just a snapshot of where things are right now. Um, you know, As we move into the environment where things like general assembly start to get financial, government financial aid, we're entering a brand new world. That means that lots and lots of organizations like these can start to produce um, different kinds of credentials that will start to play a role in how we think of and understand the, uh, the degree. And I will say that the degree is in many ways the gold standard against which all of these other credentials are now kind of trying to stack themselves up against it. So I'm not at all denigrating the degree. Uh, what I'm saying is that there isn't the um, playing field is now open for lots of different forms of recognition, and those different forms of recognition are already in use. They're already happening. So there's no way in stopping the train. The train has already left the station. Um, so looking ahead, um, so and. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of these activities. I know that some of the people in the group um, in this team, sorry, I'm so used to thinking team. Um, so some of the people in this room are familiar with some of these activities and they may not be. So I'll step through them a little quickly. Connecting Credentials is work that's being funded by the Lumina Foundation and it's looking about credentials across the entire realm, including all of those other things that I just showed you, not just the degree. Um, this was, from my perspective, a really interesting shift from about three years ago when the Lumina Foundation was heavily focused on degree completion. And, uh, and then they made a shift in the last few years starting to say degree completion is not the only thing. There are many forms of credentials. We want to make sure that everyone gets acknowledged by through a credential one way or another. Um, so that's the connecting credentials work, and it is a nationwide conversation, not just with one organization, but with hundreds of organizations. There are many, many co-sponsors co working on this right now, um, and I would suggest going to the connectingcredentials.org website and learning about, if you are not familiar with that work, learning about all of the work that's taking place. What they did a few... Um, a few months back was ask people who are working in the credentialing space to just add their names and what they were working on to a Google Doc. And there are um, over a hundred different organizations and activities taking place in the credentialing world right now. And they're not all connected. Um, so it's really about making sure that, that um, credentials work across different environments and that they're understood. 
I'm currently operating as the co-facilitator for the Common Language Working Group for the Connecting Credentials um, activity, and that is a very interesting conversation. I'll get into it a little bit, um, but it is something that needs to happen too, and a common language is probably um, a little bit of a misnomer. It's more along the lines of that we want to have a, a common translation device across different credentials. Um, the Credentials Transparency Initiative is also Lumina funded. It is looking at understanding that there are all forms of credentials that exist already and that there's no way to find all of these different credentials. Um, so they're developing a registry, an online registry for different credentials and they're basically creating a structure upon which people can um, understand how their credential might fit into uh, this new environment. Um, and it has been going on, it's coming out of, so you may know it um, coming out of GWU, so George Washington University and um, ANSI is actually where this work is coming out of and it used to be called GWU and ANSI work but now it's called the Credentials Transparency Initiative. Um, it has a relatively long time frame, I think it's been operating for about two years already. I think they have three more years ahead of them. Um, it is a very, very ambitious project uh, and I remember when I first heard it, I was like, Good luck with that. I, th I thought that we had taken on a lot with badges, but um, they have made unbelievable headway in the short time that they've been operating, and I, I have great, great hope for the work for that um, coming to the fore and being a very useful tool for people getting an understanding, not just from a consumption perspective, but also from a potential earner perspective, understanding what's available to them. Um, connected Credentials is work that's coming out of ACE, and um, that's Gates-funded work, and there is an announcement today, right now, <laughs> um, about two white papers that are being released um, toward higher ed, um, looking at higher ed and understanding um, what are some quality, what are the quality aspects that go into a credential, and then also other aspects of credentials. So I highly recommend that you jump on um, that. Uh, I believe there's a, there have been a few different PR press releases that have gone out, um, but look for those two white papers. Um, I helped write one of the ones on the quality credentials with Deb Everhart, who's been um, helping them think through that. Really amazing, very, very difficult, um, but interesting work. Uh, and then the W3C, so that's the World Wide Web Consortium, and they are looking at credentials, um, moving them into the idea of can it be, you know, can it operate within a browser, and if so, how, and in what way? Um, so there's work that's been going on for the last year or two years, I would say, looking at how credentials slot into um, browsers, and what that means is that could change the way that people understand or can find things. So in some ways, it might, um, down the road, supersede the work done on the Credentials Transparency Initiative, or it might tie in very well with it. Excuse me. And then I also have listed the PESC transcript because there's, and that's not the only transcript work. There's a lot of people looking at transcripts today saying like, can we extend the transcript? Is the transcript enough? Um, and uh, does it operate in a way that's useful or, or important or relevant to um, people, not just the earners again, but also the consumers of that transcript information? So starting to look at extensions of transcripts. Um, and I want to take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about the credentialing language and the work that I'm doing um, with that. So jumping back to the way that we talked about degrees and understanding that we, we went into the assumption that um, degrees are universal and they're understood and they're clear, um, we are aiming to have, I'm going to cross out the word universal there. So then we're not aiming for a universal language because it's not possible. And I am not the person to know this, but many, many people who have come before me know this, and uh, and I think that it's something that we don't want to keep trying to bang our heads against the wall until we get to a common language, because it's just too many stakeholders, too many people, too many activities, too many systems um, in order to loop them together. So I'm using the word inclusive, and I believe that this is a much better word uh, overall. So inclusive, understood, and clear. And when we move to the world of inclusive, that also means inclusive understanding. We can put our arms around different forms of credentials as long as we can have some translation across those tr credentials. Um, there's also the question about the, tech, the language that goes with the technology. So it needs to be both machine readable and human readable. So, um, so when we're talking about the digital world of which you all operate in, um, there are different ways and there are possibilities for some, some very naughty questions that have always been with us to be addressed by machine readability. So because of the structure of badges and some credentials, JSON-LD, which is, means linked data, um, that means that things where are connect, where there's a possibility for things to be connected from a technological perspective that would then simplify a lot of the human aspect. Um, 
obviously we're not removing the humans from this process because this is really why we're developing this. This is really developed for humans, um, not machines. So uh, we need to also make sure that people understand, humans understand it, but it also works on a layer that can sometimes make some of that human readability simpler. Um, and so when we talk about credentials today, we're really talking about all of these things. And when we're talking about a common language, we're talking about all of these things. And I will just note that during our first call for the common language working group, there was a conversation that went a little bit around and around about competencies versus proficiencies. So I'm not sure if anybody, is anybody familiar with this, this conversation in this room who's ever heard the, the, not competencies, but proficiencies. Proficiencies add up to competencies. So I will just say that there is a lot of personal investment in language already out there. And that's the reason that we need to get to a universal translator, um, sorry, not universal, inclusive translator. Um, and again, I put et cetera on this, pa on this page because it's very important to understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg um, and we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves. So we started by saying digital credentials making sense of a new world, but I'd like to suggest that it's actually, um, I'm sorry, we started by saying that it's uh, making sense of the new world of digital credentials, but I'd actually like to suggest that with digital credentials, we can make sense of the new world we're entering into. Thanks everybody, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I feel like I'm in the Nuremberg trial. Um, <laughs> I hope not. So, sorry. Um, so going back to the Google quote, um, it reminded me of the challenges of transportability of what does a degree mean when you go out for the educational, uh, when you're validating your education when you apply for a job. And so I wonder, you know, what work is being done to partner with industries that will say, I accept these badges yep. or, or, or I can validate these in some way because ultimately I think every degree program that is not like a law degree or not like an architecture degree or an engineering degree, they go out there with these transdisciplinary degrees and they kind of have a little bit of everything but they don't really validate proficiencies that might adhere nicely to that job. So I don't mean the question to be too long, but I think that what the real challenge is with badges is how do you make that badge work when they walk out of school and they go for a job? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what the key is. And using FIT as an example, just briefly, because the fashion industry is so unique, to put it mildly, um, we are deeply in integrated with the fashion industry. So there's a partnership on what we're building in our workshops and in classrooms to what they want. And I'm just, I guess I'm opening this up, you know, in a broader sense to that kind of discussion. Because I think that we are siloed as educational institutions, that we're, we're feeding on our own beliefs of improvement and iteration, but that's not necessarily getting more people hired. So I think that's a great and fair question, and it wasn't too long. Um, and I would say that that is exactly where we are. Um, that is precisely the question that's being asked is um, value. What you've asked really is the value question. How can we guarantee that anything that we're creating actually has value and market value? And some of the questions that are being asked by the Connecting Credentials work is exact, are exactly that, is is it market driven? Are we actually doing things that are demand driven and that they're not necessarily, so they're not coming top down, they're coming from bottom up. There's a request for this activity and learning. And, and I would suggest um, from a badges perspective, uh, one of the most, and I s skimmed over this, but one of the most interesting things from my perspective about badges is that there, any organization, any individual can create the badge. It doesn't, there's no specific set way to do it. Um, this is both a plus and a minus, as you've pointed out. It's a plus from the fact that that means you're not limited by anything. It's a minus because then you're entering a world into which you've asked someone to understand what it is you're trying to communicate in, an, in a new language. And what we don't want to have happen is 1,000 or actually millions of languages happening that we're asking then everyone to parse. Okay, well, this comes from Carla. And even though I attended FIT, I created my own badge because I felt like it was representative of me. And, uh, and therefore, it should still have value. Now, 
if I, if I wear my Mozilla in the open badges hat, I'd be like, yes, absolutely. It still has value. Um, if I wear the, the market driven or demand driven hat, I'm like, mm, I don't know. Um, where do I, how do I know that this is, you've also asked the other question about validation, right? So there's these very, very heavy aspects of that need to be answered. Um, I would say too, from the validation perspective, there's two different aspects there. Um, there's validation and there's verification. There's validation coming from an organization. There's verification saying, yes, this is actually the person who did this and this is representative of them. And those are two questions that are still being answered. I don't say that we have all the answers. I'm just putting that out there right now. But I would say that the conversation about where does the value lie is a really large conversation. And we are trying to get as many employers into the conversation as possible. I would also say on the other side of that argument is there are a lot of people who are saying that education is not about getting people into workforce. So there, there are many, many different factions, I would say, in this conversation, and it's important to acknowledge them all. Um, but I would say that it's a very important question, and it is attempting to be answered. Um, I don't know that anybody has a solution yet, but I do know that um, the U.S. Department of uh, Sorry, labor is um, is very much looking very heavily at this, and they are very uh, very much asking the question about demand driven credentialing, um, and that is one of the we have five different working groups with connecting credentials, and that actually is one of the working groups. Thanks for a really uh, important and timely presentation. Everything you said was of interest. I think I'd like to say first of all that I don't think there has to be a split between is it work-related training or is it education? We can do both at the same time, um, and I think we ought to be. Secondly, I have a question for you. I'm working with a lot of different industries, and I would like to talk with them about badges. As a faculty member, what authority do I need? Wouldn't I need my institution's authority to give a badge from my <coughs> college in marketing or, or writing business memos or something? Thank so you. that is another fantastic question, and uh, and it is a very important question about ownership. Who owns the badge? And um, and I will also note that um, depending. So so I'll use some examples, and maybe I'll just go back through. Um, let's see. I'll use Deacon. Um, so Deacon's badges come directly from Deacon. They're not owned by um, they. I'm going to air quote again, um, owned by a professor, uh, and they were collectively created by Deakin in conjunction with their legal department. So when we start to move into the world of credentials, we're making, um, we are uh, making statements about what it is valuable from an institution or organization developing those badges. There are professors who have developed badges that um, they have developed them and they develop them aside from their department. They haven't necessarily checked in with their department. Um, and David Wiley, who was your speaker last year, was actually one of those people who developed a whole series of badges while he was at um, Brigham Young. And, uh, and what he did, which was very fascinating, is he actually issued badges for people who were not matriculated. So he can, did not care whether or not you were matriculated at BYU or whether or not you were coming in. Um, and, uh, and you were taking this course outside of BYU, which was a very interesting proposition. I actually do not know what happened ultimately with that. Um, it, and, and it's operating outside of traditional boundaries. So I would suggest if you are interested in, in developing badges, you have a conversation with everyone that, that who would be those badges would touch. If they are coming with the organization's name out of them, then you need to have a conversation with that organization. You need to have your legal department look at that to, to because again, there are, are decisions being made and statements being made that need to be backed up legally. Um, so a really good question. Over here and then over there and then. Um, I work at a community college, and one of the biggest issues that we're having right now with community colleges is all of the metrics that we're being measured by are for completion. And a lot of people don't come to Duchess, or Duchess is where I work, um, don't come to community colleges for completion. They come to maybe get a job skill or just learn something. Um, and one of the ways that, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how do we measure that and how do we show that to all these people that are looking at us and saying your completion rates are bad. Um, and we're having the conversation on Twitter right now, but um, a combination of the e-portfolio idea plus the badges is a really interesting way to actually show that these people are, are getting something out of coming and not, quote, completing. Um, I mean, I don't have the answers as to how to back that up, 
all that kind of stuff. But it's a really interesting idea to be able to use on the com uh, community college side to show that the people that um, these agencies are saying that aren't doing well at our colleges or are bringing our numbers down are actually here and they're doing something that they're here for. Um, and it's a really interesting idea. I mean, I obviously don't have the answers to it, but um, just the stuff that you're talking about, um, linking the work that you did for the badge to the badge itself so people can look and see what you actually did. Um, it's a really interesting idea, and I think it's a lot more complete than just showing a transcript. Sure, people completed the course and got an A or whatever, but that doesn't mean anything to employers. And employers can look, um, it doesn't just have to be employers, they can look at what's attached to the badge and actually see that this person does really good work. And there it is. So just thought I'd make the comment. No, that's a great comment. And it actually was something that I mentioned yesterday. So a lot of times community colleges, and, and I myself have been to community college, so... <laughs> Um, so I would say that that is an exact example, and there are many people. So when we talk about, that's the reason I always like to include post-secondary, because there are people who have degrees who have gone back to community college because they want to, they either want to change jobs or they just have random, you know, areas of interest that they would like to see expressed at community college. And I completely agree with you when it talks about completion rates, and that is actually one of my, <clears throat> one of my bet noirs, the com the concept of completion, because uh, uh, completion doesn't necessarily indicate. It indicates that, the, that someone has hit a standard that has been set in front of them, and, and that's what is expected. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any less learning has taken place. And, uh, and there are people who are operating in this world already um, and are using badges uh, from the perspective <clears throat> that they have divided their course up into five different sections. Um, and not even sections, it's not even fair to describe it that way, and into five different areas. And as soon as you pass through or learn or experience that area, you get a badge for it. So you are immediately acknowledged for having some aspect of learning because, let's face it, people drop out of college and universities for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they run out of money. Sometimes there's someone sick in their family. Sometimes, you know, they... Uh, they um, realize that it, the commute is too far. All of these things play a role. It may be that the, they can't make the time or their, their job has changed so that they can't make that time anymore. Lots and lots of things play into why people don't complete. And yet what we've done is set up a system that says if you don't complete, you're acknowledged as a non-completer. There's nothing. You don't have anything that says I did all of this stuff up to this point. Even people who are getting PhDs, that ABD came out of somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just... Putting it out there. Um. Okay, my name is Miriam Hawk. I'm from the Open University in the United Kingdom and currently working for SUNY COIL. Ah, excellent. I'm going to be talking. And um, I, you are probably aware of that, but there's, at the Institute of Educational Technology at the OU, we've done quite a bit of work on an overarching pedagogical framework for badging that comes with a badge typology that works across the curriculum. So that, and that caters or answers some of the issues that have been addressed here so far. It's just a matter, I think, of knowledge sharing and information flow across the big pond, maybe. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but what I wanted to ask you is um, to talk just for two minutes, please, about what remains, from what I can tell, a bit of a stumbling block in terms of the, the buying in into the whole issuing of badges, and then also collecting the badge, which has got to do is with how it is carried. Because ideally, the ideal scenario would be you collect your badge and you can add it to your electronic signature, for example. And whenever you send out an email, it's going to be very visible. Yeah? I mean, it's, after all, it's a glorified URL. But that is not possible yet. We have to create our backpacks, and we carry the badges in a backpack. And in the backpack, they are somewhat hidden, which I find is almost counterproductive to what we want to achieve with them. So um, thank you for that question, and, and thank you for mentioning the Open University. And I will be talking to, uh, not Fiona, but someone else. So I'm coming to the UK and speaking <laughs> at University of Southampton. So I'm looking forward to the continuing that conversation. Um, so uh, I would say... 
your question about um, is really a question about privacy. So when we the original design for the open badges was understanding that everybody owns their own data. And uh, I didn't mention that because there's many, many. So there's the concept of the badge itself, and then are all these these concepts that f that are spread like le like um, branches out from that as well. And uh, and the idea of personal data privacy was one of the key aspects of badges. And because it was a key aspect, we developed something called the backpack. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that. It was essentially a repository that would hold badges. And we developed it because we didn't want to make anybody have to have a specific social network. So it was, it was saying that you could earn these things and put them somewhere without compelling you to put them in Facebook, without compelling him to, you to put them on LinkedIn. Um, and also, you could choose when to make them public. And choosing when to make them public is pretty significant. So we're understanding, so we're taking that very high level perspective and saying not just institutes of learning will be issuing badges, but lots of friends could issue each other's badges and maybe you don't want to make those things public. Maybe you actually want to have them collectively and keep them private to yourself, which is the reason that the backpack exists. Um, the idea of public sharing is certainly something that's baked into the badge. The badge is really designed to be shared publicly. That's where the value comes from. That's where some of the value comes from. Let me restate that. That's where some of the value comes from. Um, but being able to put them on LinkedIn, there are technological issues in a lot of situations. So the technology is not completely interoperable. And it's not completely interoperable because you have these siloed institutions and organizations who are very who are um, very financially driven. LinkedIn has its own roadmap. They want to make sure that everything that happens on LinkedIn, and they introduced the idea of endorsements, interestingly enough, a little bit after they, we talked to them about that, just we were like, hmm, that's kind of similar. Um, and there are aspects that I didn't talk about that um, are much in greater detail about the idea of endorsement. So you could earn a badge from one institution that could be endorsed by another institution that then ad automatically changes the value of that badge. It could also be endorsed by individuals. Um, putting that into your email signature is something that um, right now is a little more complicated because of the way that the badge is designed, the way that the technology that underpins the, the badge. Again, some of that could potentially be addressed by the W3C work. So there are many, many um, aspects to the technology that uh, I know when, when, when I was at Mozilla and um, people would look at us, they were like, why aren't you solving all these problems? You're a, you're a software organization. But it's not just one organization. It's actually there needs to be agreement across the aisle from many different organizations in order to make things interoperable and, uh, and understanding that there are you know, essentially open badges are an assertion. We're saying these are something that we think would make sense in the world from a software perspective and you can start to use them. And some of the value comes from people using them, but some of it comes from people acknowledging them. And we're still very much very early on, even though we've been operating for five years into this, we're still very early on in the development of the ecosystem as a whole. And that's why I'm so excited about the connecting credentials work because it's asking some of those very hard questions about when we talk about interoperability, how, how actually interoperable are we capable of being? Uh, there, yep. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I understand the importance of uh, linking both academic work and work that you've had from, you know, from experience, life experience, and keeping track of that. What I'm really not understanding is if we're really addressing the problem, even with badges. I mean, what is the difference between a, uh, a picture of an A, let's say, that you got in a course and a badge that you completed it? So it's a different digital representation where the digital representation would be an A linked with these objectives for this course, and I reached them. And then having a resume that's a digital resume saying I can communicate and here's a, here's a video of me communicating or I've done this or I've done that, and you have a whole digital representation of yourself in a portfolio. I'm not really seeing how a badge is a different representation a different digital representation of, say, a letter grade or, you know, what you got up to this point and what it, you know, isn't it just replacing it with a prettier picture? So, again, I think that's a great question. And um, and I would suggest that uh, 
the one thing that badges do, and I'm sorry I keep pushing your laptop, um, the one thing that badges do is they surface the criteria. You must write down what the criteria was in order to earn that badge, and you don't have to do that for an A or, or through an F. That doesn't, that doesn't ever get shared publicly. I'm sorry. Couldn't it just like it would with a badge? I mean, yeah, absolutely, but, yeah. so but has anybody that, done it? Isn't that the real issue, though, that we're not connecting the letter grade to what we've made the objectives in the course be? Um, I think it's a few things. I would suggest that it's not just the, it's not just the letter grade, and I think that even the A through F is a question of like what what does A mean for one organization versus A mean for another organization, or even one teacher to the next teacher. Some person's an easy grader, some person's a hard grader. Um, I do think that there are questions about transparency. I, your question to me is a transparency issue. Are are we being transparent enough? And I would suggest that uh, that the badges actually make things much more transparent than they have been. So they compel people and organize organizations and institutions to be very cognizant about what's going into what they're you're publicly stating where your values lie and where your where um, your assumptions are and that's what the badge does now if if a if a grade carried metadata boy that would be a totally different conversation right um, and I would suggest too that uh, what badges do is start to open that conversation up and say, well, what have we been doing all along? Why, why have we gone to these more opaque measures of A through, which was originally A through E, but A through F? Um, why have we done that? And, and what have we gained through doing that? Um, the idea of having a graphic with metadata embedded in it that can move anywhere is also incredibly different than the transcript. Um, so I, I would say that there, there are um, different aspects that uh, a badge introduces that certainly open the conversation, but also move it forward much, much farther than uh, a letter grade with metadata attached to it. Um, and I would just, for my own experience um, working with badge systems, understanding, getting everybody in a room to talk about what it is they think they're actually accomplishing is incredibly insightful. Um, because what I always encourage people to do is you go off, you, you go off separately, individually, and then you talk about what it is, what your goals are for introducing a badge system into your organization. What are the goals? And then you get everybody back into the room and I can guarantee that if there are 30 people in that room, there are at least 25 different answers about why people are wanting to use badges and what the goals are. And that is a different conversation than do we all understand what A means. I think there's another question in the back. <coughs> yes. Carla, thank you for a very thought-provoking and perhaps developing more questions and answers presentation. Um, and I appreciate the credentialing and the transcripting. So at the universities, at the four-year colleges, they're particularly prickly about the badge versus we have a transcript. That's where the credentialing is. And then just the legal aspects are very important for people to think about when you're saying what do you want, why do you want to introduce badges. Um, and then to build on a couple of comments, um, to Christie's point, I think the badges, certainly if you have a collection of badges and you can create a certificate, then you are getting at the completion. And um, I think that has value for the students, uh, both motivationally as well as credentialing. And I think there's a lot we can do with online uh, certificate programs that are institutions to get at that. And certainly uh, industry workforce is much more amenable and accepting of this than I would say is academe. Uh, at our college, our faculty, um, our, fa our college senate reps to the SUNY Senate reported on credentialing in December. And I have to say it was a little embarrassing and disappointing, but it, uh, it addresses and it points to the misunderstanding. Some of the faculty there were sort of snickering and saying, oh, are we now going to offer Girl Scout and Boy Scout badges? And there's a big disconnect to enlightening them on the value of badges, certainly within a classroom in terms of the motivation and the competition to, to, and, and points. It's about points. We know that uh, Weight Watchers application is about points. And, and so people do that because they can see they're winning. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I don't know how that might be being approached to close the gap between misunderstanding and I think to break down some of the barriers of what is clearly um, elitism on the credit side about badging. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on how to break down some of those barriers. 
Sure, and I'm pretty sure that the person from Open University has some thoughts too. <laughs> early adopters. Yeah, early adopters. Um, so I would say that uh, absolutely, and I have heard that myself as well. And I would also suggest that when people say, have you earned Boy Scout or Girl Scout badges, these people have never earned Boy Scout or Girl Scout badges <laughs> because because it's not easy. To, and the, it's very clear, right? So there's a very clear methodology to earning a badge, and that's um, it's actually helpful. And uh, but that aside, um, I, I would like to, to, um, distinguish from the, to separate badges from gamification and even game design principles, um, because they do operate separately. And, and when badges were first introduced, a lot of people immediately jumped on the idea that a lot of people earn badges within games. And this is, um, a continuation of that. And it is point based, typically within games. Um, the open badges world operates separately from game design principles and they don't, it doesn't, so when we talk about things like motivation, um, we have to be really careful because it depends if you're using badges as a carrot and that's a different method than if you're using badges as a representation of something that would have taken place regardless of whether or not the badge was there. Um, and that's the way I very much encourage people to think about them. This is the thing that would, ha it would have happened anyway, even without the badge. Um, and, uh, and I sometimes refer to it as what's important is the verb aspect, but it's really easy to talk about the noun. The noun is the badge, but the learning is the verb. And it's harder to talk about the verb, so we end up talking about the noun. Um, but from the perspective of um, that concept of elitism, I think that um, what is going to happen is kind of what's happened in other industries is understanding that they're already in use. They're, they're already taking place. They've already taken hold and uh and i and they've taken hold within universities like the open university where they've already implemented a whole system and done incredible research behind that system so it's not as though people are just up creating things and applying them i think there's also been a fear um based on uh how can we guarantee that there's rigor associated with this? And, um, and I think that gets back to the value question is, um, where's the rigor? How can we ensure that this is a good representation? But I would also suggest that you are the ones creating these badges, right? So if you're concerned about rigor, it's a question about whether or not you're capable of producing a rigorous badge yourself. To me, that's always been a kind of an ironic question. It's just like, you're responsible for the rigor. So if you don't, if you don't contribute it within your badge, then it won't be a, won't be a rigorous badge. Um, I think there's also a question that is very much about competition. So understanding that higher ed is now in a competitive role against other organizations. And sorry, I should actually say post-secondary. Um, but no, I want to step back. I want to say higher ed. So four-year comprehensive schools are in a competitive situation in a ways that they have not been in a very long time. And now that community colleges can issue baccalaureate degrees, we're entering a brand new world. And now that General Assembly is potentially receiving governmental financial aid, we're in a brand new world. That means that that control and hold over whether or not I want to spend $60,000 a year, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about some specific <laughs> other schools, um, $60,000 a year for uh, investment in my education, and I'm going to come out with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Um, there is all kind of research that seems to indicate that it's not working out for the student. So I understand it. My father was a professor. My mom was a teacher. Um, I completely understand why there can be a concern about it. But I would suggest that um, explaining to them that they are actually the ones in control of how this thing grows and becomes something is, um, is a very strong argument. Thank you. I know we have a lot of questions. I want to make sure we get to the side. I think this and then... The University of Bologna was open in 1088. Flash forward 800 years, and the first accrediting body in the United States was formed in New England. So it took higher ed almost 1,000 years to figure out how to <laughs> communicate value in a coherent and acceptable way through accrediting bodies. And there's, there's numerous accrediting bodies just in the United States. Will it take badges 1,000 years <laughs> to find a system of common language and value that will be acceptable in the marketplace? Gosh, I hope not. I won't be around. Um, so there, there are people using badges in Italy, by the way, and we have had conversations specifically about the University of Bologna. Um, and I would say that it is, so I am very optimistic. I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, and I would say that um, within... Okay, I'll try to be optimistic and realistic at the same time. Um, 
I would say within about five years, the, con the conversation will be dramatically different than it is right now. If it were just me and I was not trying to be realistic, I would say within two years, we are going to be in a very, very different world, um, particularly if general if the general assembly thing like coding schools um, coding boot camps start to get financial funding it changes the playing field quick and yes um, I was just at a conference where the person who's the head of general assembly was there and understanding that you don't want to spend eighteen thousand dollars in order to go through a, I can't remember how, what an eight-week process in order to come out on the other side with a job but guess what if you come out on the other side with a job that pays you seventy five thousand dollars that was a really good investment of eighteen thousand um, dollars it does change how people will get into school and what we actually call school. Um, but I, I really hope it's not that long. Um, I would say that from the provost conversations that I've had, it's a 10-year conversation. Are there, are there organizations that are like Middle States and the New England Association of Higher Education that are emerging that could operate as accrediting bodies for badging? So, um, you know, it's interesting. As, as post-secondary dives into the world of badges, um, you know, uh, Witchy is looking at, they're a strong proponent of badges, and I, and I have had many different representatives of the accrediting bodies at speeches that I have given. And anything that comes out of any institute of higher learning is going to be looked at as an aspect of what is needing to be accredited. Um, I don't know of anything that has been accredited specifically per se, um, but, uh, there's a question, too, as to whether or not endorsements will then become their own form of accreditation, that there won't be a need for an accrediting body because there will be essentially different organizations saying that that's a valuable badge to me. And because it's a valuable badge to me, I don't care if someone accredits it or not. Um, so, we're, again, we're entering into a new world where different players have different roles and the accrediting body still works within the world of post-secondary, but may play less of a role in the world of badges and other kinds of micro-credentials, nano-degrees, et cetera. But won't, won't there need to be some organization that oversees in some way, you know, the value of badges <laughs> so there is a coherent system? Otherwise, it's, it seems kind of chaotic, almost permanently chaotic. Um, so, again, I'm not sure if everybody heard that. So doesn't there need to be an, kind of an accrediting body that, or someone to oversee all of this? Otherwise, it feels chaotic. Um, so I would suggest that that is a fair question. It's uh, we're, we're entering into the worldview questions now, right? So um, does there need to be some uh, some kind of paternalistic organization that um, that oversees things? Uh, yes and no. Um, so I would suggest with this work, a lot of it is is kind of ad hoc, and it very much still is in the experimental stage. So we're still trying as very hard as possible not to be prescriptive. Um, but that said, eventually, yes, I imagine that there will be different. So I, the way I've always imagined the ecosystem for as long as I've worked on open badges is that there are strata to it and that there are people who are issuing badges and sometimes there are individuals issuing badges to one another and that doesn't need to be accredited. It doesn't need to be acknowledged by anyone. It's just friends doing for friends or, um, and then there are or institutions of higher learning or, um, or learning at all because K-12 is also looking at badges. Um, so, so that's another level and it works with the accrediting body. And then there might be organizations that arise, so exactly like the one you just described, that arise that say, hey, this is really our thing. We want to look at each one of these badges and tell you whether or not they're valuable from our perspective. So yes, that more than likely will arise, and it will be an essential part of the ecosystem. Um, whether or not it needs to be right now is a question, but whether or not there needs to be a governing body overall about someone saying, you know, this agnostic tool needs to be used in this specific manner overall, I would say the answer to that is probably no. But for specific industries, for specific contexts, yeah, more than likely, that seems to be typically how our society works. Hi, thank you. Um, I loved your presentation, and I myself think that the idea of badges is great because I kind of think that not only in you know open source education and free you know learning for all um, that this is one way to prove that someone is a lifelong learner rather than just you know motivated on getting a job or getting a degree or whatever. But I do have a, a kind of fear as an art historian and someone who studies visual culture. The one thing we really haven't talked about is the design yeah. of badges as icons, logos, or brands 
And it's kind of like the fight I have perpetually with my 15-year-old son explaining to him that, you know, Adidas is just as good of a sneaker as Nike, um, but he doesn't believe that. And unfortunately, visual symbols work on us in really, really, you know, subtle and subliminal ways. And what I worry about is the fact that if this becomes a shorthand for something, an iconic shorthand, that people who are reviewing job applications or who are reviewing digital uh, resumes will not click on the badge to get the metadata, but rather will say, oh, look, it's the Crimson H. That's Harvard. I don't even need to go any further. Whereas, you know, the work, and I understand that will happen, you know, even on a, a resume with text, that the word Harvard carries more weight than does, you know, um, just because that's where I'm from, SUNY Brockport, okay? Uh, but I do think it can be problematic in the long run and that, you know, we are all, as Steve Jobs proved, creatures seduced by the visual, whether we want to admit it or not, and we're going to click more frequently on a logo that seems appealing than on one that doesn't. And how much is design and the ability to pay a good designer um, to create your logo going to play into this, I think, is something we need to consider as well. And not your logo, but your badge. But I, I keep using the word logo because that's how I see them. So I just want to know your thoughts on that. Thank you. So uh, my undergrad degree is in design. And so you've hit upon something that has been... <laughs> I have thought about quite a bit, um, quite a bit, and uh, I have many, many thoughts, and oh God, I have so many blog posts that I have yet to write, uh, specifically about the question you've just asked. Um, and, uh, and I think it is a very important question, and uh, I want to answer that in two ways. It's a very important question, and that we need to be cognizant of that, um, and there is research that indicates that, yes, we're more than likely to click on things that we find um, um, attractive and uh, and yes, it can be used as shorthand. Um, I would also say, on the other hand, there are um, new things in the way that we're starting to look at the technology that underpins badges. And some of what I wrote about a little before, um, when we talked about the two different um, languages, the um, the human language, oops, um, uh, and the machine readable, is that uh, the way that so when we talked about. Um, online digital resumes a little earlier, I would suggest that we're, we're moving beyond the digital resume by a long shot and that there is no like paper resume anymore. before. I don't, can't imagine anybody walking any, in anywhere. Well, that's not fair. Um, I, very few people use paper resumes these days. Um, and I would say that the idea of having something that is machine readable, that can be scanned, that would actually sort people out in ways that would be useful is something that is something that we're considering. I would also say that, um, there is activity taking place in the UK where people have started stopped including um, degrees as different differentiators, and that's with Ernst and Young, which is a giant, giant organization, um, and also with uh, I think it's Penguin. It's one of the publishing houses that have stopped including degrees as ways that they define who they're going to hire. Again, this is a significant aspect. Um, but if someone has a badge. Um, eventually we may get to that point where they're going to stop sorting through and say, like, if you have a badge that says Harvard, what does that mean? Where's the value for that? Um, and also the idea of having the endorsement level layer built into that is something that uh, will play a role. The last thing I would say, too, is that we're starting to look at the blockchain. So I'm uh, I've dropped, I've wait for the last thing to drop the big thing. Um, uh, we're looking at the blockchain as a way to develop badges, and one of the questions is, do badges need to have visuals? Why should we compel people to have visuals with badges? And um, when I first heard that, I was a little taken aback myself, but then I thought, this is a reasonable question. Why should we compel people to have visuals for badges? Um, that said, I think it is one of the things that is a differentiator and is useful right now, but down the road, it may be something that becomes less of an, an issue. And there is a larger question, and there are platforms that allow people to design badges, and there are lots and lots of open source tools that allow people to um, have icons on their badges um, that, that uh, people are unaware of, but that kind of information about what goes into the badge and how meaningful or valuable is it from a visual perspective has yet to be kind of publicly discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Oh. Um, and so uh, if you guys have additional questions, Brandon, I know you had your hand up again. Let me find her. 